Are we rolling? Mic check, one, two. Okay, I think we rolling. Welcome back to Son of a Preacher Man. I'm your boy, Troy. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the biblical creation story, starting in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And we're just going to work our way through and try to get some understanding, you know what I mean? So, um, before we get started, please remember to hit that like and subscribe button. And... I'm going to start this video by telling you just a quick story about how I figured this part of the Bible out. Because the beginning of Genesis is one of the most complicated things to understand. And the whole Bible is complicated from cover to cover. And it is truly one of the most complicated things to understand. It, I couldn't understand it to save my life for a really long time. So when I first read this story as a kid, you know, I didn't get it. I didn't understand it. I didn't know what was going on. And it's a, a lot of controversy over this particular section of the Bible. You know, a lot of people got a lot of different views on what it's talking about. And I just had no clue um, as a kid reading this story. I had no clue what it was talking about. So when I got grown, I still had no clue as to what it was talking about. So one day, about 20 years ago, I'm sitting in the Nissan dealership, and I had my gun and my Bible on me. Now, the reason I had my gun and my Bible on me is because I had some very nasty characters after me back in those days. And I always kept my gun and my Bible on me. I don't know why I kept my Bible on me. I don't know if I thought it was like a good luck charm or something, or... Maybe I thought that I could glean some information out of that that would save my ass, seeing that it was people after it. So I'm at the Nissan dealership and I'm waiting to get my car fixed because the last thing I want is my car to break down while people are after me. So as I'm waiting in the lobby area, I notice it's a Time Life magazine sitting on the counter. I pick it up. I start reading. It's about the Big Bang Theory. I'm like, perfect, I'm going to be here for a while. I love anything about space. I'm going to sit here and read up on the Big Bang Theory. So this, uh, this article in this Time Life magazine, it had pictures about the different events of the Big Bang Theory. You know, it showed it in stages. You know, you, it had one picture and then it followed with a sequence of pictures describing the events of the Big Bang Theory. So as I'm sitting here reading this article in this Time Life magazine, I'm, I'm telling myself, man, I've heard this story somewhere before. I know I have. And the more I read, the more I was sure that I had heard this story before. So to make a long story short, I put the Time Life magazine on my right knee and I put the Bible on my left knee and I followed along in, in each book with the finger, with my index finger. And, you know, I'm, I'm reading the Bible and I'm looking at the pictures and I'm following along picture by picture, verse by verse. And then it hit me. It's the Big Bang Theory. The beginning of Genesis is the Big Bang Theory. OK, so I'm gonna just give it to you right there off the top. I'm just I'm putting it out there. Um, a lot of people already know this. Some people don't. But I felt it was important to start from the very beginning of the Bible. Because if you don't know what's going on at the very beginning, you not really going to understand what comes after that. So, here we go. Let's just jump right into it. So, just for starters, we got a couple things that we got to get right before we get started I know it's always like that but it's like I warned you this is a very complicated complex controversial book and so we just gotta we gotta iron some things out before we get started I asked in the last video what was God to you was he a genie in a lamp was he an invisible man was he a ghost and we're going to run into these problems all throughout the Bible. So we might as well just get it over with. We might as well just talk about this from the outset. So when we run into a problem, we've already talked about it. We don't need to go through it. And that is 
the poof. Now, what poof is, is exactly what it sounds like, like magic abracadabra poof. A lot of ultra-religious people seem to think that because God is God, he can just poof things into existence and poof them out. Whenever they run into something in the Bible that they don't understand, this is how they solve it. They say, well, God just poofed it. I'll give you an example. I'll give you a really good example. We're about to read in Genesis. And it's going to literally claim that the universe was made in a manner, in a matter of days. And a lot of ultra super religious people, they believe this. They believe in what I call the seven day theory. Uh, God created the universe, the heavens and the earth in seven 24 hour days. Actually in six 24 hour days because on the seventh he said to have rested. There is no proof. There has never been any proof. There is no evidence of proof. And yet and still, people still want to believe in the proof. And this is anecdotal evidence, I will admit. This is evidence that I'm gathering from my own personal experience. But out of my own personal experience, what I've noticed is that the people who believe in proof are most of the time uneducated people educated people tend to lean more towards science for their explanations but uneducated people nope they need no explanation no proof no evidence of anything god can just poof things into existence or poof them out of existence if he wants to create an entire universe in a matter of days he can just poof that and make it happen like I dream of genie. My question to the people who believe in poof, <clears throat> where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line with the poof? Can it can are there leprechauns? If there if there's poof, why not leprechauns? Why not Pegasus? Flying horses. Why not Puff the Magic Dragon or Pink Polka Dot Dragons appearing out of thin air? Where do you draw the line with the poof? We are going to run into this problem a lot throughout the Bible and I'm going to stop and address it every time. It is one of the fundamental reasons people get misled by the Bible. They run into something they do not understand and their explanation for it is proof. <clears throat> One last thing before we get started. I put this slide up because I thought it was important. This especially goes to the ultra super religious people that might be watching this. Read this, read this passage with me. It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. This is one of the most important scriptures in the Bible because you are going to keep this in mind every time you read the Bible, every verse, every scripture, no matter where in the Bible it is. This scripture is literally telling you not to trust what you think. Why would the author tell you that? That what you're about to read you are wrong about it. You're wrong about what you think. Why would the author say that? The author said that because he understood that this could be very misleading. He said that he wrote that because he's a genius. He had understanding and he knew that that was the smart thing to do was to warn you ahead of time that what you're about to read may not be what you think it is or may not mean what you think it means or what you think it should mean. You either know the answer or you don't. You do not get to insert your own opinion or understanding to fill in the blanks. Okay, so let's start with Genesis 1 and 1 and this is what it says <clears throat> it says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth 
And already we have a problem here. I warned you that this Bible was uber controversial and already we have controversy because the first three words in the Bible are disputed. Some biblical scholars claim that in the beginning is mistranslated and that it should be translated as when. And so should therefore read when God created the heaven and the earth. It actually makes more sense with the word when. I'm not about to make a big deal about this. I just wanted to highlight the fact that from the very beginning of the Bible, the first three words, the first, the very first word that you read, there's already controversy. This scripture was originally written in Hebrew. It was translated into Greek. And people debate the translation and they have a right to. But we will we will carry on with the reading as is. And it says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And you'll notice the author had enough common sense to show you that God created the heaven first and then the earth. It's literally worded that way that God created the heaven and the earth, meaning the heaven came first and then the earth. Why is this important? Because to those poofers who think that things just blink in and out of existence, what this is saying is, no, God created a heaven. It's an order to things. You have to have a heaven to put an earth in it. Okay? So one has to come before the other. Okay? The mom has to come before the baby. Okay? There's no poof here. Another big problem we have is when a lot of religious people read this, they think to themselves, okay, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. They're created. But if you keep reading, you'll see that this, the very scripture does not support the poof theory. It says, God, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was void and without form. Hmm. Now, why does it say that the earth was void and without form? Well, what does void mean? Void means emptiness. It means without. Think about writing void on a check. You still have the check, but the check is no good. It doesn't work. You cannot use it. So what the Bible is telling you is that in the beginning, when God created the heaven and the earth, he started out with the material to create these things, but they were not yet created. It says the earth was void and without form. Super, super religious people will tell you, oh, well, that just means void just means that it was uninhabited. No, this is saying God created the heaven and the earth and it was not made yet. Imagine someone telling you they just got jumped at a party. In normal conversation, a person announces the subject and then they proceed to, dis to describe what happened after that. You don't just come up to, to your friend and say, yeah, standing in line at the liquor store and dude sucker punched me from the side. I didn't even see him. And then his boys jumped in and they all jumped me and start punching me and kicking me. No, you started off by, by saying, hey, I just got jumped at the liquor store. Yeah. Let me tell you what happened. I was standing in line and, you know, this guy just sucker punched me from the side. I didn't, you know, you announce what happened, what you're talking about, and then you proceed to describe it or use descriptive sentences to explain yourself. Imagine a woman telling her best friend she just caught her husband cheating on her. She doesn't just say she doesn't just go up to Sally and say, yeah, Sally, I went through his I went through John's phone and. I saw all these different women's numbers and different pics of naked girls. She doesn't just start blabbing out information. She says, oh, Sally, I think I called John cheating. Yeah, I went through his phone and you know what I mean? So the Bible is literally doing the same thing. It's telling you what happened. And then it proceeds to tell you how that happened. It says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I'm announcing what's happening. And now I'm going to tell you how that happened. And the earth was void and without form. And darkness was on the face of the deep. 
and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now here's another reason why wind fits better than in the beginning, at the beginning of this scripture. Because when you read the script, this passage with in the beginning, where does water come from? If it's the beginning, how is water already present? You see what I mean? When you read it as it is, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was void and without form and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Where does water come from in the beginning? It is, how has it been already created? But when you read this scripture, <clears throat> starting off with when, it makes sense. When God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was void and without form and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. It doesn't lead to the question, where did the water come from? Because this, the passage starts out as when God created the heaven and earth. Indicating that that wasn't necessarily the very beginning. Anyways, it's not a hill I'm willing to die on today. So... We have the very beginning of time. Heaven and earth are being created. You have darkness and you have water. So let's go to the next passage. It says, and God said, let there be light. Okay, there's proof that you had darkness ahead of time. Because why would you light up an already lit room? So it says, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. So here we have what I was alluding to. All this happened in what the author says were the first day. I know that it clearly says all this happened on the first day, but you have to use common sense you have to lean not to your own understanding that is why i took the time to put that at the beginning of this presentation it clearly says this happened on the first day but you have to put the word day into context it is something i will address in the next video but there's just too much to unpack here right now so moving on it says and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and, the, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. Now I need to explain this really quick. What is a firmament? A firmament is land. It's a type of land. It's a land mass. So you're asking yourself, okay, well, Troy, how could there be land in just the middle of nowhere? Nothing's been created. And you just have land being being poofed. Are, are you are you uh, are you conforming to the poof theory? No. So what the firmament is, is space. It is literally space, like when you look up into sky and you see the stars and they're in space. And that is what the Bible is telling you is being created at this particular point. Space is literally being created. So why would they call space land? So let me see if I can explain it like this. Imagine you're at the beach and you set a beach ball down in the sand. When you, pick, when you pick that beach ball up, it leaves an imprint of where it sat in the sand. You can literally see the concave curvature in the sand from where the beach ball once sat. Well, planets and stars do the same thing in space. Where they rest, they literally bend space and time as if it were land-like. So I know that sounds absolutely ridiculous, but they're calling space land because in certain ways, 
space behaves like land. Space has very similar characteristics to land. And you just have to trust me when I say the firmament is the firmament means land and they're talking literally about the creation of space. So let's read it one more time. It says, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. Now, if anybody has doubts to, you know, my saying the firmament is space, here you go. And God called the firmament heaven literally space space and heaven they are synonymous space heaven you can use them interchangeably and god called the firmament which means land or land mass he called that heaven so if you didn't agree with me before okay well you can disagree with me and god okay so and he said the evening and the morning were the second day. Look at this extraordinary claim that the Bible is making. It's saying that space, the vastness that you stare up into at night when you're outside, they're saying all of that was created in a day. And people are just like, yep, poof. That's all he needed to do. He just poofed it right up there. So the Bible continues and it says, and God said, let the waters under heaven be gathered together unto one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And that was, of course, the third day. Once again, extraordinary claim, claiming that the earth was made in a day, along with the seas. Context. It is all about context when reading this book. Context, context, context. Common sense should tell you that they are not talking about 24-hour days. But once again, I will not have this argument here. There's just too much to unpack. So one thing to consider when reading this story is that there are creation stories that predate the Bible. One of them is the Babylonian creation story called the Enuma Elish. The Enuma Elish predates the biblical creation story by at least a couple thousand years. Um, it was written by the Babylonians, which were from Babylonia, which would be between the Tigris and the Euphrates River in modern day Iraq. So the Babylonians have this uh, weird mumbo jumbo that they call a creation story. But it basically says the same thing that the Bible says. It just says it in a different way because it, this was a culture long before uh, the authors of the biblical narrative and they just had a weird way of talking and it's kind of hard to decipher what exactly they're saying a lot of times they like to give you know uh, the stars in heaven and planets they like to give them human characteristics and they worship them as gods and so it makes it kind of hard to understand their writings sometimes but let's take a look at it this is what it says it says, when on high heaven had not been named, firm ground below had not been called by name. Sorry for the uh, dramatization, you know. Naught but primordial Apsu, their begetter, and Mumu Tiamat, she who bore them all. So, you know, it just sounds like some old Thundar the Barbarian or He-Man type of talk. You know, it's, it's talking about something really ancient. It's saying nothing had been named. Nothing in heaven had been named. No ground had been named. So we're just talking about the beginning of time, basically. It continues. 
their waters commingling as a single body. Once again, there you have waters. Where is water coming from at the very beginning of time? But you keep seeing this popping up from story to story. Water at the very beginning. Okay, so we'll 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 just keep reading for now. Their waters commingling as a single body. No reed hut had been matted. No marsh land had appeared. When no gods whatever had been brought into being, uncalled by name, their destinies undetermined, then it was that the gods were formed within them. Okay, now I don't know what any of that means any more than you, but I know this is talking about a very long time ago and it's starting out with waters and nothing has been named. So that was the Babylonian creation story. Let's move on to the Chinese creation story. And what the Chinese say is, out of darkness came light. From nothing came something. From chaos came order. Now this is interesting to me because at, at the beginning of Genesis you have Dark, you have light coming from darkness. The Chinese say, out of darkness came light. And that is very similar to the biblical creation narrative where God says, let there be light. He says, there was darkness on the face of the deep. And then he said, let there be light. So there was darkness and then light came from that darkness. And the Chinese seem to agree. They're saying out of darkness came light. From nothing came something. But my question is, if it's dark, and if you're enveloped in darkness, how do you know if there's something there or not? There could have been something in that darkness that produced that light. You wouldn't know. It's dark. From darkness came light. I don't know, it's just something to think about. So moving on, we're going to end with the Egyptian creation story. And the, the Egyptian creation story, basically it all begins with an egg. So that's a little misleading, I'll admit. It doesn't um, begin with an egg in the sense of like a chicken laying an egg, but it does begin with an egg-like structure. If you think of, think about the function of an egg. It is a container that contains a bunch of material. It, it's a container that contains all the material it needs to form what's going to come out of that egg. And so it's like a compact cosmic egg, compacted and compressed down with all the energy and all the matter and all the gas and heat and everything that's going to be needed to create the universe is compacted within this small structure. So... It begins with something that functions as an egg. Let me just tell you this weird ass Egyptian creation story. I'm not going to spend very much time on it because I'm just not, I'm not into it like that. It's not like an area of my expertise is not that interesting to me, but it's interesting how it correlates with the other creation story. So let me see if I can get through this story very quickly. The Egyptian creation story starts out with what's called the new, that's in you. Some Egyptian creation stories call it the new. You have to understand there are many Egyptian creation stories. They're basically all the same, but they all have some differences too. So the Egyptian creation story starts out with this sea of chaos. Here you have water once again. Why do all the stories start off with water? That should tell you something. It is not a coincidence that all creation stories start out in darkness or water or both. So 
You have this sea of chaos that is called the new or the noon. And within this sea of chaos, and this sea of chaos contains all the material that's going to be space. Within this sea of chaos is an egg. Or an egg-like structure. You don't. It doesn't even have to be an egg. You can call. Let's call it a seed. Okay. And and it rises out of this sea of chaos, and it's literally like a god. It becomes aware of itself. It, its consciousness. You know. It, it becomes a, a, aware of its surroundings and its environment. And so it has two kids. And these kids go off into the noon or the new to play and they don't come back for a long time. So this little ball of energy, this egg, sends his one eye to find them. The eye finds the children and brings them back. When the eye returns with the children, it notices that another eye has grown in its place and it becomes really upset. Now this this egg, this ball of energy, it's called a, a, a tomb. It has a name. It's called a tomb. So a tomb, he just moves the eye to the side and places the old eye next to the new eye. And now he has two eyes in which to watch the entire universe with. So the two kids of this egg, this cosmic egg full of energy and matter... The kids of a tomb, as we're calling it, they have kids. And those kids become the sky and the earth. So basically, it's a weird story where they're giving names and identities and, and human characteristics to space. But what they're saying is basically the same thing. And in the same order that the biblical narrative tells what they're saying is heaven is created and then earth is created after that they're saying the exact same thing as the biblical narrative so what is this egg okay well to understand that we have to talk about black holes so what is a black hole a black hole is a place. It is a place in space. It is a literal hole in space or a hole like place in space with a tremendous gravitational pull. Now, how are black holes made? They're made by supernovas. Well, Troy, what is a supernova? A supernova is the death of a giant star. We have stars that come in all shapes and si not shapes but all kinds of sizes and when our biggest stars die sometimes black holes form as a result they're formed by the star caving in on itself and leaving this hole in space a literal hole driven by its gravitational forces Black holes come in all shapes. Well, I shouldn't say all shapes. They come in various cir circular shapes or various spherical shapes. They come in various sizes. And sometimes they come in pairs. Sometimes they come in triplets. The theory was initially that black holes could even run into other black holes and swallow them up. And that brings me to what do black holes do? Well, they eat. They will eat anything in sight. Black holes used to be the stuff of legends. They were like, you know, scientific sci-fi of stories that people used in movies to make them more thrilling and exciting. They really weren't taken seriously. They were just a thought, a theory. But recently, we have proven that they are real. This is the first 
and only visual of a black hole taken in 2019 by scientists this is an actual black hole so it is no longer a theory they are real the outer rim of the black hole that sits adjacent to the actual hole it borders the black hole is called the event horizon it's the part of the black hole that it's the point of no return basically if you cross into the event horizon you are going into that hole and what happens then well you get eaten alive and stretched into uh calculations that we can't even compute and you eventually get dragged into the middle of the black hole down into its center which is called a singularity and a black hole will basically eat anything in its path it will gobble up planets it will gobble up stars to give you an idea i put this slide up this is a black hole about to eat a white dwarf star now a white dwarf star is a star that's died or is dying it's much smaller than a regular star but look at its size in comparison to the black hole that black hole is about to eat that whole damn sun and it's able to because it's going to strip it bit by bit no matter how big it is and it's going to drag it down by the tremendous by its tremendous gravitational force remember this thing had the mass of a of a giant star it had the mass of a giant sun and it's using that energy and that force to drag whatever's in its path down into that that its core into the middle of that black hole and that core is called the singularity this stream em emerging from the black hole this stream that the black hole is it emitting is not for decoration it is a black hole burp and as they eat, they spew out jet streams of energy. It is like a nightmare of nightmares in space. But it's a good way to understand what a singularity is. Because as big as that sun may be, or as big as a planet may be, that black hole is going to eat it and squish it and compact it down into the size of almost nothing. That is what in, that is what a singularity is. So you have what I call an egg or a cosmic egg. This singularity is this small area, this small space that is literally cram packed to the hilt full of gas, material, heat all the matter necessary to create this vast universe that we now have it's all crunched down and condensed into an unbelievable way to an unbelievably small size now that's what happens in a black hole but what we're talking about is the reverse of a black hole we're talking about a singularity and where not so much is being packed it's already been cram packed now this stuff is about to come out. You got this cram-packed cosmic egg, so to speak. Unbelievably packed with space debris and space matter and the stuff that space is made from. All packed into this small, incredibly small container. And it's about to blow. And then God says, let there be light. And bang. So we're going to talk about the Big Bang Theory in a minute. But that's what the Big Bang Theory means when it says bang. It was this explosion. It was this expansion. It was this release. It's very hard to really describe what it was because it happened so very long ago. But what modern day scientists say is that this so-called bang was a release 
of all this compacted material into this small container. What they once believed was an explosion, you know, they, that's where the bang came in because in the original theory, it was called the Big Bang because they thought the bang was an explosion. They said that all of the universe was started off as the size of a marble and then bang it exploded into, into the size of what we have now but scientists now have revised the theory they don't think it was an explosion they think it was an expansion because an explosion shoots out debris at various speeds it's not uniform an explosion shoots out debris in different directions at different velocities. Scientists now believe that's not what this bang was. They think it was a uniform expansion. This part in time, I've heard scientists say this, and I have to take a moment to address this. I've heard religious scientists, that means... That means people in the scientific community who are also uber ultra religious. Yeah, ultra uber religious people are everywhere, okay? So I heard these religious scientists saying, well, how could that be possible? You're telling me that this big bang, this thing just happened one time and that was their, you know, that was their hang up. They, it just happened one time and, you know, if... You know, they were all, in, you know, believing in, you know, the world was created in six days. And these were scientists. My God, these were scientists. And they actually believe that the Bible, they believe the Bible when it says that these things happen in six days. The heaven was created in a day. The earth was created in a day. They believe that. They say there's no way that. This bang, it just happened one single time. Everything in life happens multiple times. They're just hung up on this event happening one time. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Ultra Super Uber Religious Scientist, I'll direct you to when God spoke to Moses. He said, never before and never again have I spoke to a man face to face. Meaning this is the only time this is ever going to happen. I'll refer you to when God met with the Jews during the Exodus from Mount Sinai. And he spoke to Moses and he communicated and revealed himself what little he did to the Jews in the desert. And he said this is the only time this has ever happened. It was the only time that it ever will happen. It happened one time. There are plenty of instances where things happen just one time. Joshua pointed to the sun and said, son, be still. And God and the Bible said, and God hearkened to the voice of the man this one time. Never before, and never again. Is God hearkened to the voice of a man the way he did to Joshua that day? One time. So, yes. This bang in the Big Bang Theory happened one time. So, I put this slide up so that you could see the sequence of events. This slide sucks. So. So what this slide is supposed to show So we'll just go from here. How about that? So what this slide is supposed to show is the sequence of events in the Big Bang Theory. You start off with darkness like many of the other creation stories before it. You start off with darkness and bang, you have light. You start off with a singularity, 
bang, you have light. You come to a period where it's never been like this before in time. There was just this huge explosion, if you will, not quite an explosion, but something like an explosion. And look here, this says 375,000 years during this period of time after what God says, let there be light. After this happens, this ha there's a time period of 375,000 years, scientists say. Thousand. Then there's a dark age. You see this little dark strip in between this uh, blue-green area and this white area. There's a little dark space here. And you can't see uh, the writing here, but it says dark ages. What the Big Bang Theory says is that all of what would become space started off as a seed or an egg in the darkness. Then, bang, there was light. Then there was light. And there was a period to where this this light continued. And scientists say the environment would, would have been unlike any other time in history ever. But eventually the light dies out and you have this dark age, this dark period. And the next time you have light is here. And as you see here it says first stars about 400 million years ago. So after the initial bang in the Big Bang Theory... It's a 400 million year window until stars are created. And people want to say this happened in a day? In 24 hour? In a 24 hour? Okay. I'm sorry. So you have this initial darkness, then light. You have this period of light that they're saying was approximately for 375,000 years. You have a dark age. It doesn't say how long it was, but I'd imagine it was for about, it was probably for millions upon millions of years. And then you have the first stars appearing. And subsequently you have light again. It's not, it's not dark anymore because you have stars appearing. And if you look up here towards the end, towards the end of this sequence, you see galaxies. It says galaxies and planets here. And it's pointing, you can't see this line, but it's pointing to the very end of this sequence. It's pointing to the end. So here you have 400 million years from the initial bang of the Big Bang Theory. 400 million years until you see stars. And look how much further this goes until you see planets. Let's take a look at this picture, this next slide. Once again, you have initial darkness. You have the bang in the Big Bang Theory. One thing you don't see is water. I will admit that. But everything else happens in the exact same sequence. All the creation stories agree. Heaven is created first. Then Earth. Here you have initial darkness. The bang from the Big Bang Theory. This initial time period of light and I don't know if you can see this. These are molecules floating in here. They have these images floating around in here because scientists believe that this is when helium and hydrogen were created. Look on a periodic table. You'll see helium and hydrogen. They're the first elements on the periodic table. It's because scientists believe they were the first elements created. After the initial bang in the Big Bang Theory, the environment, the, the conditions were of a heat magnitude that they have never been before and never will be again. It was hot enough to produce the elements hydrogen and helium. It was the only time in the history of the universe where conditions were ripe enough to produce certain elements. And all the elements... All the hydrogen and helium that would ever be created, ever, all the matter, everything that would ever be created was all created in this bang and in this subsequent time of light. 
Then you have this dark age, this dark space where the light has died down now, but you still have this super hot environment and that super hot environment is going to produce stars. And what do you see in the next sequence? What do you see? Stars. Next you start to see planets and galaxies and what do you have damn near at the end? The Earth. Identical to the creation stories that predate it in many ways, in many aspects. The Big Bang Theory is what Moses is talking about, and Moses is the author of Genesis. The Big Bang Theory is what he's talking about in Genesis. Now, I'm going to end this. I didn't think I would need to talk about this, but I want to go into my next video with a clear conscience. Is there any dispute about the dominance of our sun? Just want to make sure we're all on the same page, because we may disagree on, you know, the creation story. But I think once we get to the sun, we should all be in agreement at that point. The sun, big ball of gas, millions of miles away, yet can still blind you. People worshipped it back, back in the day, back in ancient times. People worshipped the sun because it was the bringer of life. It provided warmth, it provided heat, it provided light. It literally gives life. We would not exist, nor would this planet exist, if it were not for our sun. I think we can all agree on that. You know, we may agree, we may disagree on if the beginning of Genesis is the Big Bang Theory. That's fine. We may disagree on if the ancient creation stories match the biblical creation story that's fine but once we get so far down in the creation story we should start agreeing i mean we can all agree that the grass came before the cow right because if the cow came before the grass what would he eat we can all agree that you know the fish came before the land animals that you know insects and grass came before the land animals and then you know the land animals came before man we should all be able to agree on that but do we agree that stars make planets the sun is the biggest baddest celestial body in our solar system it dictates everything within this solar system there is no bigger, badder body. If it was, it would either destroy the sun or the sun would destroy it. And we wouldn't have a solar system if our sun was destroyed. But common sense should tell you that stars make planets. You would agree that planets orbit the sun. Well, the reason they orbit the sun is because they were orbiting the sun when they were being made. There's no bigger, badder body in, the, in a solar system than a sun. It dictates everything. It drives everything. Its gravitational pull and force sets everything in motion. It puts everything in order. There is no poof. This is an orderly process that began with the bang in the Big Bang Theory. This, this process is a result of everything we just discussed. There is no poof. So, that concludes my little session on why Genesis 
why the beginning of Genesis is the Big Bang Theory. I hope you learned something. Um, you may agree, you may not agree. If you got any comments, tell me where I'm wrong. Tell me where I, I, I'm in error. Tell me why you disagree. And, you know, we'll hash it out on, on a different video. So, until the next episode of Son of a Preacher Man, Troy, wishing you well. Deuces. <laughs>